Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. This is the Political Drenches Local Government at Work, the show dedicated to talking about the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. Now, we are continuing our journey through the municipal alphabet today. I, along with our co-host, well, my co-host, Ian McCormack, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Today, we are bringing you the letter M, which stands for the Maritimes. Later on in the episode, we'll be speaking with a municipal consultant from Atlantic Canada. We will first, though, talk about how amalgamations can cause some headaches when it comes to bylaws. We'll then head to Surrey, B.C., where the ongoing tug of war between the RCMP and the city police force has spilled over into the media. And then we'll end in Prince Edward Island, where we will discuss the use of in-camera sessions. But first, Ian, how are you? Nice to see you again, Chris. I'm doing well. How are you? Not too bad. We have lots to discuss today, so let's jump right into it. So earlier this year, the province of New Brunswick brought in sweeping changes to municipalities, including, but not limited to, amalgamating municipalities with neighboring municipalities. Ian, when you have two partner municipalities being forced into an amalgamation, how does one navigate bringing the two organizations' bylaws and policies together? Well, flippantly, I would say carefully, but the province of New Brunswick doesn't seem to have gone taken that approach. And this isn't necessarily uh, an amalgamation of equals either, that um, in some cases, this is towns and villages with regional service commissions, which have much less authority than them. And in some cases, three, four, five, six former independent entities are being brought together. And under provincial legislation, of course, the province could do this because it has the authority within the Canadian constitution to look after municipal structures within the province. So. Ideally, this should be done collaboratively, and I understand why the province would want to do this, but in some cases it's been done uh, perhaps more with a broad brush than something that's very artistic. Now, do most of the uh, negotiations around policies and bylaws and organizational structures happen prior to the official start date of the amalgamated new community or would they traditionally start prior to that because this has been going on for some time now january 1st is when we saw a new batch of municipalities pop up in uh new brunswick which uh, were amalgamated from as you said up to even potentially five municipalities do these conversations start like on day one or were they hopefully start it when this was brought forward by the province saying that these five municipalities or one municipality or two municipalities are going to be amalgamating? Hopefully it happened beforehand. Uh, I know in the case, say, of um, Manitoba, which went through a similar process in 2015, I think, don't quote me, 2015, 2017, somewhere around there. There was uh, go find your dance partners or we'll find them for you. In the case of what happened in New Brunswick, uh, I suspect the province is the one who chose the the partners who are going to join together. I know in at least some cases, at least places we've dealt with, the province also uh, appointed an administrator, a CA, essentially a CAO. The CAO created a budget for this fiscal year, January to December as well. So there was a limited amount that the elected commission, the elected councils could actually do. And of course, the councils were elected very recently. So this is the first time that this particular group of people who are sitting on these councils would ever have had a chance to work together. Whether they did some of the negotiations beforehand, I think officially, probably not, just because they didn't have any authority. But after the after the case, after the amalgamation happened, of course, they had to try and determine which sets of bylaws and policies they wanted to use. This is also modified a little bit by some recent legislation in the province of New Brunswick which is somewhat paternal, paternalistic, where the province, of course, could override some local legislation, local bylaws too. So hopefully, it was done in advance. In reality, a lot of the a lot of the nuances are probably still being worked out six months later. Now, you you've been on the opposite side. You've worked with municipalities who have gone through the amalgamation process, and you've worked with councils who've gone on the other side of the amalgamation process. 
What's the key takeaway that municipal councillors and new mayors of these amalgamated sort of Frankenstein monster uh, communities uh, would you give them? What advice would you potentially want them to know about this process and the growing pains that potentially come with amalgamation? First of all, I wouldn't call them Frankenstein. I'd say it's uh, it's a kind of an ideally it's a natural amalgamation of uh, area geographical areas that have something in common with one another. Uh, they either kind of are upstream of the same river, they uh, have natural travel patterns, that sort of thing. The advice I would give is probably similar advice to anything I would give in anything to do with local government change, really, in that this is fundamentally a human business. So to understand one another, to understand cultures, and to recognize that anything to do with change is going to take time, and to spend the majority of that time planning for change before you actually implement that change. Now we're going to be heading to British Columbia, where Surrey Council has voted to retain the RCMP as the city's police force, while bringing a halt to the transition to the Municipal Surrey Police Service. But the move still needs the blessing from the province. Now, Surrey Mayor Brenda Lockie told reporters at a press conference that she could not disclose the estimated cost associated with reverting to the RCMP due to a non-disclosure agreement Councillors had to sign to view an unredacted version of the provincial report on this matter. Now, the mayor incorrectly, according to a CBC article, said that the NDA prevented her from revealing details on how council voted. The province required NDAs because the report was said to contain sensitive information about the RCMP. Now, to get this even more in-depth, Council's decision goes against what the province and B.C. Solicitor General and Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth has recommended and were willing to fund. So, Ian, the ongoing conflict to keep the RCMP or not to keep the RCMP in municipalities is playing out across this nation as we speak. Is Surrey the test tube baby for what more municipalities will face if they start looking at ditching the RCMP? Potentially, I suppose, test tube baby, by the way. That's what the <laughs> little metaphor you got going there. The, so, of course, the, in the previous electoral term, uh, the mayor had started down this path, the former mayor had started down this path of establishing the Surrey Police Force uh, or service and to take over as uh, police of jurisdiction from the RCMP. Since the election, he, uh, I, I believe he ran and didn't win in the next election. There's a new mayor. Uh, part of that requirement or part of that uh, slate or uh, platform was to reconsider this, which, of course, they can do legislatively in a different term. And council very recently, as you had suggested, uh, recommended that they stay with the RCMP. This was a bit of a dilemma in the true sense of the word, in that no matter which choice they made, continuing on with the Surrey police or going back to the RCMP was going to cost tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And it was also going to require some significant changes in the city and beyond as well. Surrey is a large city, and the fact that it would have its own municipal police service really doesn't come as a big surprise. So the transition being well underway. So there certainly was a lens, of, I suspect, of politics over top of the economics of this, too. If you, As you had suggested that there was a difference between what council said, they, what council chose to do, and what others had recommended that they do. Whether this is a bit of a bellwether about what might happen in other places around the country, certainly there is some noise about this. Alberta is talking about an Alberta provincial police force, for example. Other municipal, other provinces have gone with polit political, uh, sorry, provincial police, OPP, for example, or Sud de, de Quebec. And others, have, lots have municipal police too. Um, one of the interesting things is about police tr standards, and it's my understanding there aren't common training standards for police across the country. And I know the Center for Canadian Police Reform is starting to push at that front too. It's a, it's a, whether it is a bit of a, a canary in the coal mine, I don't really know, but it does seem to be something very significant to, to Surrey and probably other um, cities in the local, in the lower mainland of BC as well. So I, I know a lot of people across the country are actually watching it just to see what happens. So. Getting back to the original sort of statement that I made in the opening introduction, I've never seen a municipality in a province fight this hard in the news, though, because the mayor is saying one thing, the province is saying another thing, 
And it seems like there's a dysfunction that's going on between what is actually the information that can be put out there and what the information that needs to be confidential due to the NDAs. Um, in your time in municipal governments and in, in, in consulting with them, have you seen municipalities ever go toe to toe in the media with the uh, the province and the municipality come out looking good? <laughs> no. So <laughs> now, try this again. Yes, I have seen the conflict. No, I have not seen anybody look good. And the conflict can either be led by an individual municipality, Surrey in this case. It can be led by the other side, province in this case, or it could be through proxies like provincial municipal associations or the political or the police associations or chiefs of police or something like this in this case. But I haven't seen this, and this is one of those cases where nobody comes out of this looking good. And to that, I think there's going to be some long-term hurt feelings that, that, that is going to occur. This is going to start off uh, or create a negative culture or a bit of a downward spiral. And it's going to take some time to turn this around if there wants to be a positive culture created between Surrey, the RCMP, the provincial, provincial government, and maybe the regional uh, regional municipalities in the lower man, mainland too, who are probably watching this quite closely, based on whatever impact this might have for them. Pro on top of this, of course, the very recent decision of the federal government not to cover the uh, the back expenses or back costs of RCMP salaries during the course of the most recent negotiation, and most, if not all, of uh, Canadian municipalities will now be paying more for RCMP policing. And of course, that's going to add a little bit to this conversation or debate throughout the country too. Charlottetown councillors are being brought to task by the PEI Ombudsperson Office about how a meeting was conducted in February. Council went into a closed session on February 2nd to talk about whether to open a warming centre in the city and eventually decided not to. A review of Council records showed the council had spent more than 25 hours in closed sessions in the first few weeks of 2023 and more than 18 hours in open debate on this issue. Ian, municipal training outlines when and how an in-camera session of council should be conducted, correct? Uh, well, so municipal legislation would actually outline that based on the province or territory. But ideally, training should cover that as well, though I mentioned that bringing that nuance because training isn't mandatory for local elected officials across the country. But yeah, ideally, that topic should be covered. I find it very fascinating, this story, because we talk about transparency and we talk about how government should be open. But there is a time and place for closed sessions of uh, council, correct? Because it's legal land and personnel, if I'm not mistaken. And I know we're in Alberta and it could be different across the country. But in Alberta, it's those three that you can technically call an in-camera session of council. Yeah, that's a big generality, of course. We say land, labor, legal, because they're all elves and it makes a nice little roll off the tongue thing. But yeah, those are typically, ideally, the the or no, legislatively, the, the what gets covered in a closed session or private or in camera, and they all mean the same thing, is things that would harm the municipality or person by being discussed in public at first. So when you talk about land, things like land negotiations are not what you're going to have a conversation with in, in public. When it comes to labor and you're talking about your CAO contract or the latest union agreement. We're not going to talk about that and do that negotiation in public. And when it comes to uh, legal things, if there is action being taken either against the municipality or the municipality is doing it themselves, that's another thing you're not going to do in public. That all said, however, the decisions that come out of all of those things have to be made in public. So provincial or territorial freedom of information and protection of privacy legislation is usually what's behind what gets discussed and what doesn't under your land labor and legal thing. So we'll be right back after a quick message with our interview with Craig Pollitt of, uh, well, Strategic Steps Incorporated. <laughs> Welcome to M is for the Maritimes on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work. Today, we are honored to have Craig Pollitt on the show. 
From May 2001 to December 2022, Craig was on the front lines of municipal governments in eastern Canada as the past CEO of municipalities of Newfoundland and Labrador. He left that position and started his own municipal consultant firm, Paulet Strategies Incorporated, and just in the last couple of weeks has joined our co host Ian's firm, Strategic Steps, as Vice President Atlantic for Strategic Steps Incorporated. In today's chat, we will be chatting about municipal governments in the Maritimes. So, Craig, welcome to the Political Trenches. Let's get this chat underway with my first question, and that is, in your opinion, what is the state of municipalities like in the Maritime Provinces? <laughs> flux but i bet everybody <laughs> has that answer right that's that's the generic answer anytime anybody asks anybody about the state of municipal affairs anywhere in canada almost anywhere in the world it's change it's in flux and that's absolutely the case here um nova scotia is going through all kinds of changes in terms of growth and different challenges for different kinds of municipalities new brunswick just had a tremendous uh, sort of structural reform process happen. Uh, PEI, Prince Edward Island, has newish legislation that they're grappling with and some other changes happening. And I think, like the rest of the country, municipalities more and more in this part of the world are finding themselves engaged in conversations that 10 years ago they weren't engaged in, or 20 years ago they weren't engaged in, around social issues, around housing, uh, around immigration. So it's there's a, there's a lot bubbling up all the time. You did make a reference to, <laughs> we're dealing specifically now with the Maritimes, so the three provinces. You've made reference to some of the significant flux in your word that's happened recently and is on the horizon as well. How differently do the Maritime provinces operate from one another? Um, because their relative populations are fairly small. <laughs> yeah, so legislation differs quite a bit uh, across the three maritime provinces, um, their systems actually differ quite a bit. So in Nova Scotia, you've got some very large um, regional municipalities, Halifax Regional, Munis uh, regional Municipality, Cape Breton Regional Municipality. These are essentially municipalities that take in what used to be counties. And then you still have across the province, county governments, you know, the municipality of Kings County, and you have some independent municipalities within those geographic entities. So in, in Nova Scotia, for example, I think they're at about 49 municipalities. In Prince Edward Island, completely different landscape. Uh, PEI has the newest legislation, as far as I recall, of the three. Uh, and that's the one that's getting closest to sort of enabling legislation or more permissive legislation. The rest of the legislation in the Maritimes and in Newfoundland and Labrador is quite old and quite prescriptive. But in Prince Edward Island, they've got an issue of, uh, you know, they have a few dozen municipalities. Then they have huge swaths of land with no municipal government whatsoever. It's all unincorporated land, um, which causes challenge, as you might guess, in terms of zoning and that sort of thing. And of course, New Brunswick, New Brunswick's been grappling with um, how best to take a regional approach to municipal government for quite a long time. They had a lot of municipalities, not as many as Saskatchewan, not as many as Newfoundland Labrador, but quite a few for their size. And they've just gone through, well, in, in my, since I've been in the business, I think their third or fourth significant restructuring. And the latest one has dropped them from 107 municipalities down to 79. And they now have no sort of uh, local service districts or non-municipal entities anymore. Everybody is in something. So their legislation differs and their structures differ between the, the three quite a bit. You did make a reference to, <laughs> we're dealing specifically now with the Maritimes, so the three provinces. You've made reference to some of the significant flux in your word that's happened recently and is on the horizon as well. How differently do the maritime provinces operate from one another? Um, because their relative populations are fairly small. Yeah, so legislation differs quite a bit uh, across the three maritime provinces. Um, their systems actually differ quite a bit. So in Nova Scotia, you've got some very large 
um, regional municipalities, Halifax Regional, Munis uh, regional Municipality, Cape Breton Regional Municipality. These are essentially municipalities that take in what used to be counties. And then you still have across the province, county governments, you know, the municipality of Kings County, and you have some independent municipalities within those geographic entities. So in, in Nova Scotia, for example, I think they're at about 49 municipalities. In Prince Edward Island, completely different landscape. Uh, PEI has the newest legislation, as far as I recall, of the three. Uh, and that's the one that's getting closest to sort of enabling legislation or more permissive legislation. The rest of the legislation in the Maritimes and in Newfoundland Labrador is quite old and quite prescriptive. But in Prince Edward Island, they've got an issue of, uh, you know, they have a few dozen municipalities. Then they have huge swaths of land with no municipal government whatsoever. It's all unincorporated land, um, which causes challenge, as you might guess, in terms of zoning and that sort of thing. And of course, New Brunswick, New Brunswick's been grappling with um, how best to take a regional approach to municipal government for quite a long time. They had a lot of municipalities, not as many as Saskatchewan, not as many as Newfoundland and Labrador, but quite a few for their size. And they've just gone through, well, in, in my, since I've been in the business, I think their third or fourth significant restructuring. And the latest one has dropped them from 107 municipalities down to 79. And they now have no sort of uh, local service districts or non-municipal entities anymore. Everybody is in something. So their legislation differs and their structures differ between the, the three quite a bit. Yeah, you have a role with the Atlantic Mayor's Congress. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to talk to us a little bit about that and some of the big issues that are being seen collectively as well. So the Atlantic Mayor's Congress started back in 2001. Uh, former mayor of Halifax, Peter Kelly, convened a group of mayors, like-minded mayors from around the region. And um, I'm trying to remember what, there was an issue they were getting together to talk about. It escapes me now. And it went well. They decided we should do this every year. And that went so well, they decided we should do this twice a year. And that's been going on for the last 22 years. Um Matt Kerrigan is a gentleman that's been running that. They're sort of executive director for the last 22 years. Matt's just retired, and they've quite nicely offered me the position to run this, this organization now. And at the last meeting in Amherst, Nova Scotia, I think we had 31 municipalities from the region represented by their mayor uh, or deputy mayor. And it is, it's a fascinating group because there is always, anytime you get municipal folks together, they're going to talk about roads. They're going to talk about water and sewer. They're going to talk about zoning. They're going to talk about, you know, provincial overreach into what they're supposed to be doing and funding access to revenue. Gosh, like it, you can go back 50 years looking at AGMs from some of these associations and they were talking about lack of revenue and the, the, imbalance in the revenue system between federal, provincial, and municipal. But this group also spends a lot of time sort of circling back to what I said earlier, talking about things that maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago in some places, municipalities were not talking about. So at the last meeting, there was a big discussion on guaranteed basic income and trying to pilot something along that lines in the region. Uh, there was a huge discussion on housing, uh, a big discussion on policing. I mean, policing is a hot button issue in the sector right now, right across the country with the uh, the retro pay decision for the RCMP. And you know, there, there's a lot of municipalities across this country, Maritimes included, where they're sort of scratching their heads, looking at their budgets, thinking, well, I'm not allowed to run a deficit. And now I've got this extra multi-million dollar bill that I didn't expect. What am I going to do with this? You also mentioned as one of the topics that have come around there, harassment, which is something we've concentrated on over the last little while as well. So there was, there's been a couple discussions about that. So at this last meeting, this was my first meeting sort of in transition with Matt. Matt is retiring and I'm taking over. Uh, the next meeting is in Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador, by the way. 
which will be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but harassment and civility in the municipal sector, it's been an issue with the Atlantic mayors. It's been an issue um, with all of the provincial territorial associations in the region. Most of them have had so the you know the municipalities, Newfoundland, Labradors of the world, Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, most of them have had big discussions or resolutions around this idea of codes of conduct, how people behave in the municipal sector, not just counselor to counselor, which is an issue, but resident to staff, for example. We've had a lot of conversations around that table about the need, unfortunately, to protect municipal frontline staff from harassment from residents uh, or harassment from campaigns or whatever. So that at this last one, at this last meeting, uh, the conversation got pretty, I don't mind saying it got pretty grim. People were sharing the kinds of emails and tweets they get on a daily basis, uh, mainly women. I mean, I don't think that should be, would come as a surprise to anybody. They they get more of the vitriol than men do, uh, and almost exclusively from men. Um, but there was a big discussion about, well, what do we do with it? You know, we can arm our staff with tools and tactics to try to deflect and whatever. But I think there was a real desire for a bigger conversation about this affects the humans involved, right? There are there are politicians who are humans, despite what you may believe. They're actual humans with families and lives and feelings. And there are staff involved who take a lot of the brunt of this. So the conversation turned to the conference that Strategic Steps had uh, just back in April, bucking the trend. And the direction I got from this group, so my first sort of my first uh, task assigned to me by the Atlantic Mayor's Congress is to come to them with a proposal for a similar kind of conference in Atlantic Canada. Ian, it sounds like we're on a road trip to Atlantic Canada in the it Maritime here this <laughs> next year. So uh, Ian, I'm game if you are. Um, I want to mm -hmm. I want to go to a topic that's kind of controversial, but it's an important one that's going on in this country right now, particularly in Western Canada. The uh, Rural urban divide in uh, uh, Western Canada mm. is quite prominent. Um, now, in the Maritimes and even in Newfoundland, Labrador, and Atlantic Canada, are you seeing such a divide where it's the uh, rural communities versus the urban communities for funding from the provincial governments, funding from the federal governments? And I know in New Brunswick, it's even you can even go even further down that line of the Anglophone to the Francophone communities. And then you can go even further down to that, to the Eastern communities versus the Western or the Northern and the Southern. It, it, it's a very dynamic uh, province, the New, New Brunswick. But are you seeing a divide between municipalities and that mentality of everyone should be working together, kind of growing apart when we are seeing that play out federally? Right. Um, I mean, it's definitely there. I will preface this by saying in the Maritimes, it's always been there. This is not a new thing. Uh, when you've got a province like Nova Scotia, and not to pick on Halifax, but the, the fact is you've got <laughs> a it. very large center, you know, for, oh, I love Halifax. Don't, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going there. But, you know, Halifax, there's a, the population of Nova Scotia is a million, roughly. Halifax is almost half of that. And you can't have that vast a difference between most of the communities in a province and one community in a province without some sort of competition. I don't think that's, and I'm not sure how it plays out in Western Canada or in like Northern Ontario or whatever, but the municipal side of things is really just one venue, one channel where that shows up. Um, I think that debate, that divide has been there for generations. Um, I don't think it's being exacerbated necessarily by the municipal system. I'll say that. I will say um, in New Brunswick right now, there is a real challenge because you've taken a lot of folks who were comfortable 
in the equilibrium. Rural weren't really happy with what they were getting. Urban was never really super happy with what they were getting. And now you've jammed them all together in a single municipality. And I think theoretically, the hope is they'll just have to work it out. And I'm never a big fan of they'll just have to work it out. <laughs> These are this this is not I used to say to, to people all the time, they would talk about, uh, you know, we, we don't need to overstructure municipal government over time. Things will just adjust. And I used to think to myself, this is not moss reclaiming a burnt over section of forest. These are man made structures that we control. It's not nature. Nature is not going to reclaim the municipal system and make everything work well. So in New Brunswick, they've got that very real challenge that they can't sort of be comfortable in their own worlds anymore because they're together at one table. And that's going to be fascinating to see how that is out. Um, for the rest of the region, you know, in, in PEI, it's very much a municipal versus not municipal sort of dichotomy, I think. Uh, in Nova Scotia, it is rural county versus larger centers. Um, what I do find interesting about that whole process, though, is you've got organizations like FCM doing a really great job of bringing more of a rural focus to their policy material. Um, but when you look at funding, so provincial government funding, federal government funding, most of that funding outside of what we used to call the gas tax, the community building fund, I think it is now, something like that. Most all other funding is what I would call uh, competitive based funding. Municipalities compete for that money. And urban centers compete with one another. Small competes with large, small competes small. I actually see more division coming out of that model the fact that they all have to fight with one another for scarce federal or provincial resources than the actual urban versus rural thing. Greg, I want to thank you. And Ian, uh, well, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, and uh, talking about municipalities is kind of now a pastime, pastime, pastime for myself. It, it's uh, just it, it, great to have someone on the other side of the country who's always interested in talking about municipalities. So thank you so much for doing this. I will talk about municipalities any time somebody asks me to. I was asked the other day to write a blog on a municipal issue, on reform in New Brunswick. And they said, it's got to be 500 words. <laughs> I'm like, you're dreaming. It takes me 500 words to say hello. I'm only gotten started. So anytime I'll talk about municipal issues. It's my passion. Well, thank you so much. And our full interview with Craig will be airing next Wednesday, but we'll be right back after this quick message. So Ian, another great episode. And this for Maritime's great interview, great conversation with Craig. Yeah, it was. And I was reflecting on some of the stories we talked about. It truly was a coast to coast show today. We talked talked early on about Surrey and we finished off talking about Newfoundland, if you like. So we've got all, what, four and a half time zones covered. So hopefully everybody's got something in today's episode. It certainly has. Um, but what's next? What's coming up for strategic steps? Uh, I know you guys just opened up a new office in the Atlantic uh, provinces. So, But what else is on the horizon for strategic steps uh, for municipal contracting? Of course, it's a, it's a, there's a lot going on at the moment. There's not a lot happening in terms of provincial territorial elections this year. So we're not doing a lot of that type of work. There's a lot happening around strategy and governance, conflicts of interest, no, codes of conduct, that sort of thing. And as Craig made a reference to as well, we've been asked to consider doing a, a bucking the trend type symposium to address abuse of elected officials and administrators somewhere in the Atlantic provinces as well. That likely wouldn't happen for a while yet, uh, maybe not even until next year. But it is something that we're certainly having a look at. And it's kind of nice now for us to be able to work coast to coast because we have people in D.C. and we have people in Newfoundland. So that's kind of cool. So in two weeks time, we'll be back with another new episode of the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, the letter N, which will be announced in a few short weeks. But until then, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, social media. 
And also, if you want, subscribe to the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're currently listening to the show, please be sure to hit us uh, up. And also, if you have a story you want us to talk about, please feel free to send us a message. Ian's and I's uh, messages are open on social media. Happy to take your suggestions on what you want to hear Ian and I discuss on a future episode of The Political Trenches. Until then, Ian, always a pleasure. You too, Chris. See everybody in a couple of weeks, I guess.